Good morning, good afternoon. This is Mark Richardson with Vibrant Technology, and I welcome you to another ME Scope modal webinar. And uh, today's topic is TRN chain using two triaxial accelerometers. And we're going to be uh, looking actually at a couple different app notes that we have app note number 50 and number 51, which both deal with uh, TRN chain. And um, we will uh, be going through this. Uh, We've got a couple of folks with us joining us. So I want to introduce first Brian Schwartz, the Director of Engineering Applications. He will be uh, assisting us with, uh, with this. And then also my father, Mark Richardson Sr., the President and CEO of Vibrant Technology. And uh, both of them were at iMac last week and we had a, a lot of good response from that. So I, if you were attending iMac last, last week, we'll, Hope you guys had a chance to stop by and talk with Brian and Mark. A um, couple uh, housekeeping items before we get going here. Um, we are recording this webinar and we will be posting this out to our YouTube site here. Uh, early part of next week, we'll get that uploaded to the YouTube site. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to take a look at that, we got all of our past webinar recordings uploaded on there. So if you miss anything, in this webinar, or you want to go back and review some of the older webinars, um, there is an entire uh, library of all the old webinars out there. Uh, in addition, we will should have some time for some questions at the tail end of this webinar. If you do have some questions, feel free to type those into the uh, question dialog box there in the GoToWebinar panel on the right side of your screen, screen and uh, we'll get those questions answered for you. Uh, with that, let me hand things over to uh, to these two and uh, we'll get going here. Okay, yeah, well, thank you. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> and uh, welcome all of you that have joined us. Uh, you can see that I have on the screen here, application note 51. Now these application notes, we have quite a few of them uh, on our website. Uh, they're in PDF format. Uh, there's an a, a, uh, MEScope project that goes along with most of them. So we're going to go through some of that today uh, in MEScope and show you how that all works. Uh, but as Mark mentioned, there are actually two app notes that talk about the same subject, uh, app note 5050 and app note 51. So I'm going to start off and go through App Note 50, first of all, because it's a little simpler, and the steps in that App Note are identical to the ones in 51. Uh, let me back up and just explain to you what a TRN chain is. This is something that's unique to ME Scope. Uh, Brian Schwartz, who's one of our engineers, he and I kind of developed this idea together and we use that for other calculations in ME scope specifically the ODS FRF calculation which is a little different than a frequency response function but similar where we do spectrum averaging and windowing and we work with the auto and cross spectra however if I take well by definition a transmissibility and that's what TRN stands for transmissibility chain. That's rather large word. So in ME scope, we shorten it to TRN chain. And it's a different way to take data. And we'll look at that in a minute. But a transmissibility is a ratio of two outputs or two responses. Whereas a an FRF is a response, typically accelerometer response, divided by the force spectrum. And if we're doing impacting, that's a very flat spectrum over uh, the range of the impact. Or if we're doing random excitation with a shaker, again, it, it's typically a, a broadband excitation. So an FRF isolates the modes of this structure in that type of a measurement. Transmissibility doesn't do that, and we'll see that in a minute. However, it's a much easier measurement to make uh, because I don't need to measure the force. I don't need uh, to move. I can just move two accelerometers along together on a structure. So if I'm testing a bridge or pipeline or anything large, 
uh, the advantages with transmissibilities, I, I measure two accelerometer responses, then I form the ratio of one over the other in the frequency domain, and that's what we mean by a transmissibility chain. Now, the chain is that we, we have a common degree of freedom or a common location and direction between uh, two transmissibility measurements. So that forms a chain as we go along, and then we seed that chain with an FRF, and we get a uh, single reference set of FRFs by seeding the chain. So that's the advantage. In MEScope, you can set up this measurement in the acquisition window, which is our software that will talk to a number of different hardware acquisition front ends. MEScope is simply a software uh, only, but it does work with a number of third party uh, acquisition front ends. So we're going to we're going to use that today. And then uh, the seeding operation happens in the data block of a TRN chain where we seed it with an FRF. And we get a set of single reference FRFs and we can get mode shapes by curve fitting them. Or we can seed it with a, uh, a uh, cross spectrum and we will get a set of cross spectra. We can also curve fit those and get mode shapes and frequency and damping, or we can seed with an ODS FRF. And I won't go into all the details there, but an ODS FRF is, as I said, similar to an FRF, maybe even similar to a cross spectrum because it has a magnitude and phase in it. So uh, it can be integrated and differentiated. And we use ODS FRFs with our video uh, ODS processing, so we can compare accelerometers with video data. Again, I'm going off on a tangent here, but let me explain what you're looking at here on the screen. This is the title of the webinar, and then we're going to go to the other uh, app note, app note 50. Now, these app notes are only accessible if you own a Emmyscope license. Uh, if some of you who are attending perhaps don't own a license, uh, you can still, by attending today, you're going to be you're going to have a copy of this webinar, so you'll certainly have all the information. But this is something that's exclusive for Emmyscope owners, license owners who are on support. When you go to the website, you can download these app notes, and the first box here just says you need. Uh, several options. You need the uh, multi-channel, that's our acquisition window, and you need the advanced signal processing because that's where we process the TRN chain data. Now, with most of these app notes, and we're still working on them and improving them and adding new ones, you get an Emmyscope project. You can download that by clicking here, and it's in a zip file. Uh, that'll show up uh, in Windows in your download area. Uh, VT Max is the newer version of the MEScope files. Uh, we have an older version, but they're interchangeable. So all the newer ones are have a, a uh, name VT Max dot VT Max with the MEScope file. And then this webinar, we're going to look at some PDFs of PowerPoints, so you also can download these PowerPoints that we're going to look at today. So this one, this app note uses the Jim Beam. This is a common test article that is, was developed by a guy named Jim at Navcon Engineering, one of our resellers in, here in Los Angeles. Uh, but let's go over and look at App Note 50 here for a minute. So here's App Note 50, same title, but with two uniaxial accelerometers. So rather than two triaxial, and if we're using triaxial, we need at least six channels of acquisition, simultaneous acquisition, because these measurements rely on that. Uh, with two uniaxial excels, we're only going to get motion in one direction however we only need a two-channel analyzer and some of those are very cheap thousand dollars for the modal shop two-channel analyzer 
So anyway, let's go through the PowerPoint slides that I've put together that will basically go step for step. There's, you can see there's a lot of words in here. Uh, let's just go straight to the PowerPoint and then we'll we'll execute all the steps in here. Uh, see here's step one, random responses, and then we're gonna go to step two, acquire a TRN chain. So let's go ahead and do that. I'll go to the PowerPoint presentation and Brian Schwartz, who's also in attendance, so maybe help out at the end with answering questions. Uh, again, uh, he is one of the originators of this whole idea of using transmissibilities to measure vibration and then ultimately getting a set of FRFs, which we can curve fit a set of ODS FRFs or a set of cross spectra single reference that we can curve fit from this transmissibility chain. So let's go through this. What is a transmissibility? It's a, a unique measurement and post-processing capability in ME scope. Conventional modal testing has limitations that are overcome with the TRN chain test. TRN chain only requires two accelerometers. In this case, they're gonna be uniaxial. They're just gonna measure motion of this plate in the vertical. Uh, and it doesn't require a fixed reference sensor. So what does that mean? In a normal single reference set of data, either with an impact or a shaker, we have what's called a reference and the roving sensor. The reference sensor is the one that's fixed throughout the test. The roving is the one that's moving from point to point to point, or if I have a whole bunch of accelerometers, I put them all on there together and run wires to the analyzer or data acquisition. But you can see with a fixed reference, if I'm touch testing something rather large, uh, I got to run a long wire to that reference from the reference back to the acquisition system. Now this plate here is dimensionally, we have this at Vibrant, it's two by three feet, not very large. So the issue of running a long wire is not that important here, but it's a, it's a simpler test and we'll see. Because we're gonna go through a whole simulated test here using MEScope where we're gonna acquire some random data and uh, then we're going to seed it with an FRF and get a set of uh, FRFs that we can compare with the original set. So what do I mean by original set? Well, we did an impact test on this on this aluminum plate, and we're going to start off with that data. So here's the definition. I already mentioned that transmissibility is a ratio. This is a definition of two discrete Fourier transforms. So we interchange the word FFT and DFT. Uh, the DFT is what you get from the FFT algorithm. And of course, Hemiscope has an FFT built into it uh, that works with any number of samples. And we'll see here that we don't have just powers of two. Many of the analyzers only work with powers of two. Uh, Hemiscope has a, a unique FFT algorithm in it. Okay, so transmissibility calculated in the same way as an FRF. We use the auto and cross spectra instead of just dividing two DFTs or one into the other. We can use a handing window to reduce leakage. We won't get into all that, but that's a signal processing uh, step that's done when I have random data and the signal is not completely contained in what we call the acquisition window. Spectrum averaging is another way to reduce extraneous noise. And in a testing environment, we usually have some noise sources that we can't control, so we can average them out of the auto and cross spectra. Uh, calculation, to do the transmissibility, we need two or more TR, TWFs, time waveforms, that are simultaneously acquired. So again, we're gonna relate one response to another because they're gonna be simultaneously acquired. Uh, but it's different than an FRF. It's a different complex waveform. Peaks in a transmissibility are not resonance peaks. That's very important because we've had customers who say, well, I can't measure the force. I'll just 
measure transmissibility, and then they try to curve fit that data in MEScope. It doesn't work, and we'll see why in a minute. Uh, okay, so here here is the definition of the chain. I've already mentioned it. Here it is in writing. The chain is formed when each transmissibility has the same DOF as another transmissibility in the chain, and they can be in any order because MEScope software will uh, match up DOFs and work its way through the chain to come up with um, this is the advantages here. Either or both accelerometers can be moved between acquisitions, so we can do kind of a slinky fashion, hopping one over the other. So we only got to move one accelerometer as we're doing the test and working our way down, let's say, the bridge or the pipeline or whatever it is. After it has been acquired this way, and then each transmissibility has to be labeled with the point and direction of the measurement, then we can seed it with an FRF, a cross-spectrum, or an ODS FRF, and we will get a single reference set of measurements. So that's what's required in modal analysis. Curve fitting a single reference set of measurements, that gives us mode shapes and frequency and damping. Now we can curve fit any FRF, any cross-spectrum, any ODS FRF, any one, uh, and give frequency and damping, but we need a single reference set, a spatial distribution of the vibration on the surface of the structure in order to get its mode shape. However, the seating is real simple. I only need one FRF, one cross-spectrum, one ODS FRF, so I will have to measure force if I'm going to seed with an, an FRF, but not with a cross-spectrum or ODS FRF. So this is just saying what I've been already saying here. When I do the seeding, I get a single reference set of data. Now the, these measurements can be curve fit using it to get experimental mode shapes. And in MEScope, the curve fitting is all, even if we're curve fitting ODS FRFs or cross spectra, we window that data with something called a deconvolution window, and then we use FRF curve fitting on all that type of data. So that's very useful if I can't measure forces, any kind of an operating car or driving around a test, tra a test track or machine running, uh, building shaking. Um, we can do curve fitting of what we call output only data or operating data. Okay, so we're gonna start off here by capturing the and we've already done this, capturing the dynamics of between all these different points on the on the aluminum plate by doing an impact test, a roving impact test. Very simple, very common. Most MEScope users, if they're doing troubleshooting or they're trying to verify fine element models, whatever, impact testing is the easiest. Now, you can't always do impact testing, but when you can, it's the easiest way to collect a set of FRF data. So, FRFs are calculated from simultaneously acquired pairs of time waveforms. That's how it all starts. Uh, I don't need an FFT analyzer. I just need a data acquisition system that simultaneously acquires. That means the filtering, the anti-aliasing anti filters, and then the analog to digital conversion is simultaneously done between two or more channels. In this case, we only need two one for the force, one for the accelerometer. So here's a set of measurements that we made, FRFs, and you can see that they got resonance peaks. So if we count the peaks, one, two, three, four, five, there's at least five modes in this bandwidth of data. Okay, now we're gonna get into the app note. Step one, we're gonna take the FRF data you can see down here a little block diagram, and we're going to use that as the dynamic model of the flat plate. We're going to use what's called, uh, well, we call it MIMO modeling, and the command in MEScope was called transform outputs. So what that will do is take time domain inputs, we're going to take a random force in the time domain, FFT it to the frequency domain, multiply it by the experimental FRFs, 
inverse FFT the result and we'll get back a set of random responses. Now you can see we're going to put the we're going to simulate all this with a random force over here at one in the z direction, the vertical direction, and we're going to compute all the output. So let's go to Emiscope and carry this out, and we'll get something that looks like this, and we'll come back here and talk about it in a minute. Okay, here's Emiscope, and I want to open up App Note 50. VT Max. I already have it on my on my desktop or on my computer, and that can be downloaded from the cloud as part of this app note. So you can go through this same thing here. This is just saying that you want to save no save options. And I'm not going to do that because this is a demo project. So even if you don't have the correct options in Emiscope, the project that's saved out in the cloud is what we call a demo project. And it's just like these projects up here. You can't save anything, but you can execute them. Now, here are the steps of this app note. Calculate random responses, acquire the TRN chain, seed the chain. We're going to seed it with an FRF. And then we're going to do three different comparisons of the results with the original set of FRFs to see you know, basically we're going to do a round trip and then we can do it all over again if we want to. But let's just do this first one. Now, this is a standard option, actually a standard feature. It's not an option. All versions of MBScope, all packages have the ability to create these hotkeys. And behind each hotkey is a what we call let me just show you this one. I'm going to hold down the control key and click on this button. Here is a script window. All it is is a spreadsheet of Emiscope commands. So any command, virtually any command in Emiscope can be put into a spreadsheet like this. And the target window, here's the name of the window. Here's the command and here's a little description of what the command does. So this is this is programming. Now, most of you being engineers, I know you don't like to program. Only the engineers are vibrant, like to write programs. But I started in this business in 1973 at an instrument company called Hewlett Packard. Hewlett Packard no longer sells FFT instruments, but they did back when I went to work for them and started developing modal software 50 years ago. And we had something in the analyzer called keyboard programming. And it was just the same as what we have today. One of my favorite ways to program uh, MEScope to do things automatically. Now, we're not going to go through all this today. We're just simply going to execute it. So I'll push this button again, and it will clear the screen. And now it's putting up a dialog box, and it's basically telling me what it's going to do here. Uh, and it's got a little timer going on, so I can dismiss this anytime I want. And here's what we got. Here's the random force input. I'll just zoom in here. You can see this is just random data that was created in a data block called random force at 1z, one time waveform. We can create these in Emiscope also uh, with another command as part of the signal processing. Down here is the what we call plate 30 FRS. Well, there's 30 of them in there, and they're FRS. So if I scroll through these, these are the FRS that we acquired during an impact test of the aluminum plate. So they are a complete description of the dynamics of the plate given input at 1Z. So over here, you can see uh, well, let's just take a quick look here in the spreadsheet. You can see the DOFs of each FRF are 1Z, 2Z, 3Z, each of the points on the model with a reference. The reference is always behind the colon. This is our way of designating FRS. And you can see there's 30 of them in here and a single reference at 1Z. So that's how this data was, was acquired. Now, interestingly, the data was actually acquired with a roving impact test. So roving, we impacted at each of the 30 points, 
And so the roving degree of freedom goes in the front of the colon, and we had an accelerometer located at 1z in the corner. That was our reference. So this is a single reference set of data. You can see the units, g's per pound. It's an FRF. So it's acceleration divided by force. That's what we're looking at here. Over here on the right are the responses that we got with the command, what we call multiple input output command. This command uh, is part of our signal processing in the transform menu, and we, it computes outputs from inputs and FRFs. So here, these are all just random. You can just see they're just random responses of the gym beam. And since they're outputs, uh, measurement type, time waveform, uh, I think it's also labeled as an output here. Yeah, there it is, input output. It's, it's an output or a response. It's in Gs and it's got DUFs of the 30 degrees of freedom, the 30 points in the Z direction. Okay, so that's that's the first step. Well, let's go back and see what the next step is. So here it is. This is this is a picture that we were looking at in MESCOPE. Second step is to acquire the TRN chain. So let's go back and do that. I'm going to go back to MESCOPE again. I'm going to execute the second hotkey here that has a different script behind it, and I'll press that. Okay, it's setting up, this is the acquisition window over here. We'll look at all this in a minute. So TRN acquired by the acquisition window in the upper right. Data is acquired two channels at a time. That's how we form the TRN chain uh, from the responses on the lower left. So these down here. So let's just go ahead. All right, it's gonna start. So on the model, and this is part of our acquisition window, it actually shows you on the model with some accelerometers, little icons, where it's taking the data, where it's acquiring data. Now this acquisition is is walking through a data block. So let me put this back here and we can see hopefully. All right, so it says, do you want to continue the acquisition? If I say yes, let's just say yes, and it'll just take a minute or two to acquire the data. So it's going to go on. And here it's doing the slinky test. So you can see that only one Excel is being moved each time. However, you can see that with the colon in front of one of the DOFs, that's the one in the denominator or the reference, the other one's in the numerator. So this is how the data is being calculated. Over here, these are the transmissibilities that are being calculated below, and here are the time waveforms that it's using to calculate each transmissibility. Down here, it's just accumulating all the transmissibilities of the chain into another data block called TRN chain. So we'll just let it rattle on here and it's just gonna it's gonna take a minute to get it through all of it and we can come back and do this again and and have it just skip all these points. But it's uh you can see it's just gathering data from a pair of points. So you can imagine yourself out let's say testing the third floor in a building where the building is just shaking like crazy and you want to get the mode shapes of the of the floor. I've done tests like that on concrete floors, you know, reinforced steel. Uh, it'll vibrate just like this plate here. The mode shapes will look very similar. I've done impact testing on floors just like we're kind of simulating here with this transmissibility test. We can stop this and start over. However, let's just let it finish. It'll take a minute. And that's another reason we're not gonna do the gym beam. It takes a little longer because it's got, well, it's got 33 points on the gym beam and it, it gathers the triaxial data almost as quickly as this uniaxial data here. So this is all just emiscope processing data as if you had collected time waveforms uh, with an acquisition front end and then post-process the data in MESCOPE. It can do that out of a data block or it can do it connected to some acquisition hardware. 
and we have a number of them we support. But we've had engineers do it exactly this way. Uh, sometimes it's just easier if you're driving a car around or you're exciting with random shakers. Just take the time records, put them into a data block, and then post-process with the ACK window. Now you have to have the ACK window option, which is a extra cost option to ME scope, but it's very cheap. And so I think we're finished here. Okay, so scroll through the TRN chain. Here it is. Uh, we should have 29 of them in here. 29. What does it say? Well, it says 30 measurements. I think there's something else in this data block, but. Uh, yeah, there's an envelope down here. You can see that we've got an envelope. Now, we use this for our uh, video ODS, where you've got thousands of measurements off of a video, and then we form an envelope so you can see where the resonance peaks are. So if I click down here, I'll, I'll, I'll see that. Kind of confusing. Lots of resonance peaks because if I move this around, you can see that those those are not resonance peaks, so I misspoke. As I scroll through here, those are just peaks that are formed because I divided one DFT of one accelerometer by the DFT of another one. So this is, we can't curve fit this data. There's no resonance peak that shows up in every measurement. This is a transmissibility chain. All right, let's go back and see what else is being talked about here. Okay, we just went through this whole thing. We actually used a Hanning window. Uh, we did 10 averages. The data blocks uh, that we looked at, actually, we made 20, 29 pairs of points. We made 29 or calculated 29 transmissibilities because we went through a pair of points at a time. So here's some things about the transmissibility chain. It's a different complex waveform and transmissibility is. Each transmissibility has units of Gs per G. Now you can see it down here. This is a copy of what we just looked at in ME scope. 29 of them in there. And then the envelope was at the end where the peaks are just showing up all over the place. Um, each one has a different reference. Well, let's go back and look at that. See, because look at the references over here in this spreadsheet. Remember the reference is behind the colon and the roving is in front of the colon. So here's, here's the measurements we actually made. The first one was between 2Z and 1Z. And then we went to 3Z and 2Z. That, you know, we hopped the onesie over to three Z and made another measurement. So that's what it's showing here. And then all the way down to, uh, okay, here's an FRF in here um, and a couple of envelopes, measurement envelopes. So those, those will accumulate in there because uh, I've run this several times, this project. All right, now let's go to the third step. Let's seed the chain. with an FRF. Now you saw that FRF in there. Okay, on the left will be seated, so it hasn't done it, with an FRF from 15Z and 1Z. So we just picked a random point. Now 15Z, we'll look at that in a minute. That's, scroll through the FRFs with reference 1Z on the right. So the 15Z, we went and found the transmissibility in the chain so we could start unraveling the chain. So here's the chain over here of the measurements we made. And here's what we got out of the chain when we seeded it with an FRF. Now you can see the, the peaks are lining up here because those are modes of vibration. Those are uh, resonances. Let me just scroll this down here, you can see. Now there's a little bit of noise because remember the responses were random noise. Now we only did 10 averages. Typically with random signals, you may want to do 25 or 50 or as many averages as you want. Uh, Scope will allow you to do that. Uh, you don't need contiguous 
sets of data, it will do overlap processing where it'll use some data from the previous acquisition window and then some new data from the next. Uh, in this case, we took 2,000 samples. Now these FRFs are gonna have 1,000 samples in them. What are these FRFs or the transmissibilities? Well, those are 1,000 samples also. However, let's go ahead and compare answers now side by side ODS display. So let's just go ahead and do that. I can bounce back the, the uh, PowerPoints are gonna take us through these same steps. But let's just go ahead uh, in the interest of time here to get through this. And uh, now we're comparing mode shapes. Actually, we're comparing an ODS. Uh, this is a comparison display in ME scope on the left are the source of data is the plate 30 FRF. So these are the ones we got from the impact test. Over here are the TRN FRFs. These are the ones down below here that we just calculated from the TRN chain. You can see there's a little bit of noise on there. However, here's two ways to compare mode shapes and ODSs. In this case, when we're sitting on a resonance peak, uh, we can say that the ODS is being dominated by a resonance or a mode of vibration. Now, that's not always the case, but with a simple structure like this, we'll see that it's pretty much always the case that we see the ODS kind of looks like a mode shape because it's being dominated by the resonance. These, th This is called modal assurance criterion and shape difference indicator. This is something unique to ME scope, the shape difference indicator. It actually computes the difference between the two shapes. MAC value is a collinearity of the two shapes. So think of them as two vectors in multi-dimensional space. MAC will tell you whether they lie on the same straight line or not. They can be scaled differently, but if they lie on the same straight line, the two shapes, then the MAC value will be one. SDI will be one if they actually have the same numbers in them. So what this is saying is that this, at this resonance, 340 hertz, or 339 down here, they are virtually the same. Let's, let's scroll over here to another peak, 99 and 100. So there's another mode shape. Again, the ODS being dominated by a resonance. Let's scroll over here and look at another one. Again, very good correlation between the ODS being dominated by a bending mode of the plate itself. As we go up in frequency here, the mode shapes get more complicated looking. Uh, I wouldn't call them complex. I'd call them complicated. I mean, these are complicated complex mode shapes, but you can say that because of the light damping on the gym beam, there's very little phase in the that's showing up. These are like what we call normal modes. And you can see the node lines, that they both have very similar node lines, the black lines. And you know, these are combinations of bending and torsion. Uh, we run out of names for these. If we go down here to the, you know, the the lowest frequency, we call that first torsion. So it's the lowest frequency torsion. This one we would call first bending in the long dimension because it's, the plate is more flexible in the in the, you know the dimension that's a little bit longer than the width. Then we get up here, we get uh, well. What did we do? We lost the mode here. Well, this is a like I would call it second torsion. And then what do we see up here? Uh, even more complicated. So there we can only identify it by its frequency as opposed to, there's another mode in here somewhere. Where was it? Let me just scroll down here and see if I can find it. There's another resonance peak in here, which ought to be the other bending mode. Oh, well, one, two, three, four, five. I guess this is the one I was looking for. Bending in the stiff direction. We didn't look at that one before. 
yeah you can see it up here on the top i'm zoomed in so it's uh i don't there it is okay let's go on to the next step let me just see we'll go back to the all right we've been through this step seeding the chain four step side by side animation we've already done that okay mac is a measure of collinearity sdi is a measure of the difference between the two ods's now here's another way to compare answers so let's go back and do that one uh in me scope so side by side i'm going to do data what we call an me scope data block correlation now what's going on here original frs on the left so here's our impact testing data on the right are the trn uh, frs however they have different numbers of samples in them if we go over here and uh, let me just very quickly look at the data block properties these original measurements only had 275 samples of data we call that the block size over here what we calculated from the random responses has a thousand samples so in order to match these data these two data sets up along the frequency axis so that's what data block correlation does it goes at each frequency between these two sets of data and imagine a line cursor at each sample of data and we're computing with the 30 measurements a shape and then down here we're computing its mac value between the shape in the over here in the trn frfs versus the shape from the original plate 30 frfs however we can't it's apples and oranges so what we do there's another command in me scope where we actually paste it's a paste command we paste these measurements over here on the left in with these measurements on the right and what it will do is interpolate the data so that's what we're looking at up here this is a set of my original impact data but it's in, been interpolated so that its x-axis matches up with the x-axis over here so that's a lot of word to tell you that see the block size ending frequency 1100 hertz that's that's what all this data has in it over here is 1100 hertz but now the x-axis matches up so 1097 thousand samples here's the frequency relation uh, resolution between samples now we can compare this data with this data and these are the answers down here that we're getting and you can see at every frequency from dc up to almost 1200 hertz we have mac values here which are all one we have mac or sdi values here which are all one so these two sets of data matched up, even though we can see some little noisy peaks in here due to the random uh, responses that we process to calculate these FRS. Let's go on, data block correlation. Now we're gonna do the same thing, but we're gonna compare them measurement for measurement. And again, we need to match them up along the x-axis first. So original FRS on the left, 275 block size 275 samples here's the trn measurements over here on the right mac pairs correlation so above so now what we've done is actually put the values into a spreadsheet which normally would hold ods or mode shapes but we can use a spreadsheet for anything we can put temperatures in this case we're putting mac and sdi values in and one of the graphic pictures that we can generate is called magnitude ranking out of any shape table and it orders them from the highest magnitude down to the lowest magnitude so if we go all the way over here here's the here's the here's the worst correlation but it's still very high 99.7 percent uh of this guy i think yeah let's just 
Okay, 99.85 is the worst correlation of measurement 29Z with reference of 1Z. Of course, they all have reference of 1Z now. We're comparing apples and apples. So again, we're getting a very good correlation and you can see that the best correlation is up here almost 100%, 997. So that's comparing one of these measurements in the in this data block with one of the measurements that we calculated. Okay, so that pretty much covers everything in this app note. There's the, MP, the uh, measurement number pairs correlation. Let's summarize. The TRN chain was simulated by cal calculating random responses to a random force applied to one corner of the aluminum plate. So we were able to do that because we had a set of FRS for the aluminum plate and we could apply a force at 1Z because that was the reference in the data. That's where the accelerometer was when we did the roving impact. Okay, then it was seeded with an FRF for the aluminum plate. So we, we did a round trip, basically. We, we started out with 30 FRS from the roving impact. We calculated using the transform outputs. That gave us the random outputs. Then we simultaneously acquired pairs of random outputs from the data block of time waveforms. That formed the TRN chain in the acquisition window. We stored that. That would be like simulating a a TRN chain test with two uniaxial excels and a two-channel spectrum analyzer, or just data acquisition. Finally, we compared MAC and SDI values in three different ways. So we compared ODS FRS during animation. We compared two sets of FRS at each frequency, and then we compared matching pairs of measurement numbers from the two sets of FRFs. So we could go through the gem beam. We, it's identical to this, only we use two triaxial accelerometers. We do the same comparisons. Let me just show you real quickly. Uh, here's the presentation that was the title of our our talk. Uh, this is all the same verbiage. We'll get down here. Here's the now this data was taken with a roving accelerometer test, a roving response impact test. So in order to test the gym beam, we simply hit it with a hammer at one of the points. It doesn't matter. That's our reference. And we robed a triaxial accelerometer around on the gym beam to, to get this set of um, FRFs, they capture all of the dynamic properties, the input-output properties of the gym beam. So with 33 test points, you can see they're all labeled up here, 33 test points, uh, XYZ at each point, we got 99 FRFs, bigger set of data in this set. We go through the same MIMO, multi-input, multi-output, using those FRFs up here to calculate random outputs. And here they are down here. We got a single random input at DOF15Z. So where's 15Z? Well, that's out on the end of the one of the beams here. Yeah, the top beam. So there's where we put the random force in. Come down here. And there's are the random responses. Here's where we use the acquisition window and a different hotkey to walk through and acquire transmissibilities down here. They don't have resonance peaks in them. They have peaks because we got 160 of them. So we got 29 by five. Each pair of triaxials, we get five uh, transmissibilities in the chain. Now you can measure more than that, but in this case, we only measured uh, five transmissibilities per pair of points. Well, that's enough to form a chain 
And here is the chain being seeded. So above are the original FRS, and they had 501 samples in them. The TRN chain FRS had 1,000 samples. So we had to go through the same kind of a process where uh, we interpolated FRS. And that, that's just amazing to me. Again, this is all linear. We can look at the math and the linear interpolation between two samples of data over here to match up with the x-axis over here gives us very usable results. Now you can see the MAC and SDI don't match up as well at some of the lower frequencies. There's a lot of noise in this data. Uh, you can see there's, there's just some noisy stuff down here below the, the resonances. And then here, the MAC and SDI don't match up quite as accurately. Anyway, let's wrap it up, Mark, and do we have any questions? Uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and get those typed in. We don't have anything right now. Uh, a couple comments, though. Um, Good. Pat McCard, one of our engineers, uh, did uh, want to weigh in on a couple things. The first thing, uh, just to remind us, uh, TRN chain avoids both long cables as well as the need to strike the structure hard to get a response at the reference when the roving point is distant from the reference point. Um, basically, just one of the you know wanted to highlight some of the the benefits of using the TRN chain. No need to beat the snot out of your structure. <laughs> That's right. Is that what you said? <laughs> like yeah. Well, let's just go back here and we can go through this very quickly. And <clears throat> so here's the random responses. But if I acquire the TRN chain, uh, okay, it's hooking up to the ACK window, but very good comment from Pat. And that is, I'm going to say, okay. Okay, now you can see it's down here. It's acquiring 10, 10 averages or 10 samples of 2,000 samples each because this data block has uh, 20,000 samples in it for each. But let me say no here. And so do you want to acquire, continue acquisition? I'm going to say no. So here it is. There's the whole test and it rattled through the whole thing. And of course, it already had answers in the data block. But the point is that uh, in a typical impact test, if the impact point is a, quite a ways away from the reference Excel or any Excel, then we may have to hit harder. In this case, as long as we're getting good response from the input, wherever we apply it, uh, in this case, I'd probably want to apply it right in the middle so that the acquisitions would be, uh, you know, they'd be good all over. See, there, the acquisition or the input doesn't matter at all. The acquisition is just pulling up the responses. So we'll just rattle through this one more time. And um, so I could just hit right in the middle of this thing. Of course, I wouldn't want to hit on a node line. I want to hit on an active point. In this case, we actually simulated over here on a corner, which is good. But if we just let it rattle through, here's all the points, all the pairs, and we ended up with uh, 29 in the in the data block here of measurements. Okay, anything else, Mark? Uh, no, just a, a reminder. This um, some of the animation may look a little jerky here, and and that is not any scope. That is actually due to the go to webinar, you know, the the bandwidth and so forth, it, it makes the animation look a little bit jerkier, but actually in the software itself, it's nice and smooth. So just wanted to point that out. Yeah, uh, the, no the questions at this time. The better solution is uh, if you don't own a Miscope, buy a copy. Or <laughs> there you go. Or you can yeah, a subscription. You can lease a copy for uh, you could do a monthly rental if you want to just uh, kick the tires. Go to the for website. Yep, go to the website and rent Emmyscope for a month and you can do all this yourself and learn a lot more by going That's through these, these, you know, hotkeys and behind each hotkey, we didn't get into it today. You can see there's there's quite a few steps in here that it's carrying out, but this is all automated in Emmyscope. And I can go hit any one of these hotkeys anytime I want and uh, review 
these steps that we did today. So here's here's the side by side animation coming up again and a little explanation of what you're looking at. And so, you know, once once this is set up, ME Scope does a real good job. There's something else going on in here. It's actually finding the peak. You can see I'm I'm getting near a peak and letting go and it finds the peak in the data and shows me the ODS or the dominant mode shape. Okay. Anything else? Good stuff. No, not at this time. We'll uh, we'll wrap it up there. And again, we'll uh, get this spun up on our YouTube site uh, just as soon uh, as we can here, probably in a couple of days. We'll get that uploaded. And if you got any questions, feel free to reach out to us at sales at vivetech.com, and we'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. And uh, we'll get another uh, webinar spun up here probably at the uh, you know, beginning, middle of part of March. So yes. Yeah, we'll announce the topic. Is, Again, yeah. we're going to use these, some of these app notes because they walk through with hotkeys. And, you know, in this case, we've got six steps that some of them are longer, some of them are shorter, but we'll go through the steps. So it's a real good way to learn how to use ME Scope and to see what it does using these app notes. Excellent. With that, We'll let everybody go and uh, have a great afternoon and an enjoyable weekend. We'll talk to you guys next time. All right. Good day. So long. Mm -hmm.